Coming up on today's Airborne, has the Sikorsky Prize been won? Bombardier's C-Series nears its first flight, and Cessna's TTX adds icing protection. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Will the Sikorsky Prize for human-powered flight in a helicopter be going to a Canadian team? An announcement could be imminent. Aerovelo, a Canadian team that is competing to win the $250,000 award, said on its blog earlier this month that it has unofficially satisfied all the requirements set out to win the prize. The team wrote June 14th that their Atlas aircraft flew for about 65 seconds at an altitude of about 3.3 meters and stayed within the 10-meter box for the duration of the flight the previous day. They stress that the results are unofficial and are waiting for official confirmation of the accomplishment. The Atlas aircraft is similar to the University of Maryland's Gamera 2, which has come close to satisfying the requirements but has not yet been able to do so. Gizmag reports that Aerovelo first flew the Atlas in August of 2012. It was the fourth human-powered helicopter to fly. Aerovelo grew out of the University of Toronto's human-powered vehicle design team that was established in 2006. The Sikorsky Prize is being offered by the American Helicopter Society, which is currently reviewing the data submitted by the Aerovelo team. Reuters reports that it will be at least a month before the Bombardier C-Series Flight Test Vehicle 1 makes its first test flight, according to a statement released Wednesday by the Canadian plane maker. This is the second delay announcement for the C-Series, the first coming late last year because of an unspecified supplier problem. Prior to Wednesday's statement, it was thought the all-important first flight might be imminent. The announcement of the delay was followed by a 4.5% drop in Bombardier stock on the Toronto Stock Exchange. The new schedule will reportedly give the company time to complete some additional software updates. Designed for the growing 100 to 149 seat market, the 100% new C-Series aircraft family combines advanced materials, leading-edge technology, and proven methods to meet commercial airline requirements. Bombardier says the C-Series aircraft will be up to 12,000 pounds lighter than other aircraft in the same seat category, and will provide passengers with a best-in-class wide-body cabin environment in a single-aisle aircraft. The delay was announced just days after the Paris Air Show, which saw a steady flow of news from rivals Boeing and Airbus, and little excitement for the C-Series. The industry has already seen delays plague Boeing's 787 Dreamliner and the Airbus 380. And this latest delay raises skepticism regarding Bombardier's plan to see the C-Series enter service in 2014. Cab Ice Protection's patented TKS system for flight into known icing is scheduled to enter service with Cessna's new single-engine TTX aircraft as early as the fourth quarter of 2013 or early 2014. Jody Noah, Senior Vice President, Cessna Single-Engine Propeller Aircraft, said, quote, With ice protection and an operating ceiling of 25,000 feet, the TTX will give pilots greater flexibility to plan flights in varying weather conditions." End quote. Cab Ice Protection's TKS system uses flush-mounted titanium leading-edge panels for the wings and horizontal and vertical stabilizers. The panels have laser-drilled holes that secrete TKS ice protection fluid. Pilots can select three flow rate settings via panel switches depending on the existing icing conditions, norm, high, and max. The system includes a backup mode to provide pump redundancy. The propeller and windshield are also protected by TKS fluid. Cessna says the TTX TKS system by CAV Ice Protection is easy to use and easy to maintain. 
When delivered, this Fiki system will be approved to the latest and most rigorous standards by the FAA. Vintage aircraft with radial engines will have a special focus as the Vintage Aircraft Association is hosting the Round Engine Rodeo on Monday, July 29th through Saturday, August 2nd during EAA AirVenture 2013. Vintage aircraft owners are invited to the gathering of radial-powered antique aircraft located in the vintage area on the EAA AirVenture grounds. Twice daily, vintage aircraft expert Ray Johnson will be interviewing hand-picked vintage aircraft owners and pilots in the VAA Star Circle. A select few antique airplanes and their pilots will also be giving interviews at the Air Show Center stage on Phillips 66 Plaza throughout the week. In addition, every evening, vintage aviation enthusiasts can swap stories around a campfire in the vintage area. Vintage pilots on their way to Oshkosh are also welcome to stop at Hartford Municipal Airport in Hartford, Wisconsin on Friday, July 26th through Sunday, July 28th for a grill out and refreshments with other vintage enthusiasts. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. One of the jewels of Virginia Beach may be disappearing, as one of the largest collections of World War I and World War II aircraft in the world is up for sale, leaving the future of the Military Aviation Museum in Pungo, Virginia in serious question. Gerald Yagen is the owner of the collection and the operator of the museum in the small town in southeast Virginia. He told the Virginia Pilot newspaper Monday that he has been subsidizing the museum heavily every year, and his business is no longer in a position to provide that support. Yagen has been assembling the collection for years, according to the paper, restoring the warbirds to flyable condition. He opened the museum in 2008 and has continually expanded the facility. Yagen said there are nine groups who have expressed an interest in acquiring his airplanes, though he said he doesn't know how many he owns. He estimates the collection at about 50 aircraft. He has sold two so far, a Boeing B-17 Heavy Bomber and a Falk Wolf 190. City officials say they were surprised by Yagen's announcement. Councilman Bob Dyer called the museum one of the jewels of Virginia Beach. Delta Airlines has acquired a 49% stake in Virgin Atlantic, making the next step towards a full joint venture between the two carriers. Virgin Atlantic will place its code on 91 Delta routes, including both transatlantic and domestic U.S. routes. Delta will place its code on 17 Virgin Atlantic routes, including the recently launched Little Red Domestic UK services, connecting London to Manchester, Edinburgh, and Aberdeen. The two airlines announced their intentions to enter into a joint venture agreement in December of 2012. Last week, unconditional merger clearance was granted by the European Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice closed their review of the transaction. 
As of Monday, Delta has successfully completed its acquisition of a 49% stake in Virgin Atlantic. This review is expected to be completed during the third quarter of 2013, and the implementation of the Delta Virgin Atlantic joint venture is anticipated to occur in the first quarter of 2014. The countdown to Air Venture at Oshkosh is on, and it will be here sooner than you think. One opportunity not to be missed, especially in light of recent events, is the opportunity to interface with the FAA. In today's Barnstorming, ANN's Editor-in-Chief Jim Campbell says this is one time when we all must be there, be vocal, and be counted. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Well, Oshkosh is a little bit over 30 days away, which means basically life here at ANN HQ is complete and utter hell. Yeah, we're prepping, and to a certain extent, this is going to be our biggest Oshkosh yet. We've got a lot of plans. We particularly have plans along th uh, th a uh, theme of three subjects, uh, chief of which is innovation, but another also revolves around activism and speaking out against the ills that threaten aviation. Hence, the subject of this particular barnstorming. I'm hearing from a lot of folks who are basically saying, well, I hate what the FAA did, and I hate this, and I hate that, so I'm not going to Oshkosh. Folks, if you don't go to Oshkosh, they win. The more damage done to EAA, the more damage done to this industry, the more damage done to how we look to the rest of the world, the less strong, the more weakness we show, well, that gives the FAA that much more of a mandate to kick us around and do with us what they will. Not a good thing. Let me strongly suggest this, and I mean not only suggest it, but urge it. Go to Oshkosh. Come join us. We'll be there. We'll be covering the blazes out of it like we always do. We're going to have the better part of 30 people there. We're going to have our own building as we have every year, but this year we've made an investment in Oshkosh and that we bought our building, and it will stay there permanently at Oshkosh to show how much we feel, how strongly we feel about the event, about the industry, about EAA, and about our place in this whole thing. We've staked a claim. So should you. Come to Oshkosh, participate, but also be vocal. We don't know if Huerta's going to have the guts to show up and do the meet the boss session, but somebody will have to speak for the FAA there. And we need to speak politely, firmly, even aggressively, once again still politely, and let them know the kind of nonsense the FAA's pulled should never be pulled again. They not only didn't have the right or the mandate, but they pulled it in the most underhanded, bizarre way we could possibly imagine by pulling all this barely two months out from, uh, from Oshkosh. Very little warning, horrible manners in the whole thing. Do it our way or the highway. Come on, folks. This is an industry that has extraordinary history, and the FAA should be serving it to the best of its ability, not the other way around. Come to Oshkosh. But when you see a controller, when you see an FAA staffer, the worker bees, so to speak, let them know how much you appreciate them being there, how much you think their bosses are jerks, or whatever the case may be, but let them know that their contribution and their participation is not only welcome, but encouraged. But to the bosses, to the folks who made this decision, if the COO, Mr. Grizel, shows up, if the uh, administrator shows up, Mr. Huerta, and I strongly suggest that he does after everything that he's done, make sure he knows who you are, how strong you feel, how strong this industry is, and more important than anything else, that they work for us and not the other way around. Come join us at Oshkosh. I guarantee you, we'll be there. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell, 30 Days and Counting. And now for a story about a man who found himself literally up a tree without a paddle. For his 60th birthday, Joe Barbara of La Center, Washington, wanted to do something different. He landed on the idea of attempting to set the distance and duration records for a lawn chair balloon. His goals were to travel 268 miles and stay airborne longer than 13 and a half hours to set both records. This according to television station KGW in Portland, Oregon. But he ran into a few problems along the way. Prior to liftoff at 7.30 local time Saturday, several of the 100 helium balloons he had hoped would provide his lift popped. He had to shed a lot of weight 
including his supplemental oxygen, cameras, and shoes, just to get airborne. Not having the oxygen became problematic when he reached 20,000 feet in altitude. He had hoped to make it over the Cascade Mountains, but was unable to do so. When the lawn chair rig started losing altitude, his ground crew was just hoping for a safe landing. The adventure ended 25 miles from the launch point, about 40 feet up in a tree, near Lewis River in Washington State. Luckily though, Barbara was rescued from the tree. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, wrote those words decades ago, but soon he will give new meaning to his own words. The Associated Press reports that the remains of Roddenberry, his wife Majel Barrett, along with the cremains of James Doohan, Scotty on the original series, digital files, DNA, and hair samples from science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke will fly into eternity together, carried by an experimental solar cell developed by NASA. Roddenberry, whose remains have been sent to space and recovered before, died in 1991. Majel Barrett, who played nurse Christine Chapel on the original series and who provided the voice of many of Starfleet's computer systems, passed away in 2008. Duen died in 2005. The launch, currently scheduled for November 2014, is being arranged by Texas-based Celestis, which is in the business of launching cremated remains into space and returning them to Earth. But on this mission, the remains of Roddenberry and Barrett, Duhin, and the rest will be launched into space to stay. The payload will travel through space propelled by the experimental Sunjammer solar cell. Celestis says the journey will be recorded by cameras on board the spacecraft and streamed live online. Well, that's our program for Friday, June 28th. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. And please join us again next Tuesday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.